Greetings, everyone. Welcome. My name is Andy Neal for the Ashland New Place Festival Play for Keeps podcast, located here in beautiful Ashland, Oregon. Today, we want to share with you a conversation I had with Frankie D. Gonzalez. Frankie is a playwright and TV writer whose work has been featured across the country. His play, Even Flowers Bloom in Hell Sometimes, was a finalist in 2019's Ashland New Place Festival and was recorded as a part of this podcast, which you can hear here in two weeks. It was also selected for development by the Repertorio Español Nuestros Voces National Playwright Competition, the Great Plains Theater Conference, the Lark's 25th Annual Playwrights Week, and was a semi-finalist for the Eugene O'Neill National Playwrights Conference. Frankie is originally from Queens, New York, but now resides in Dallas, Texas, but recently did spend some time living in Los Angeles, California as a writer for the popular Netflix series 13 Reasons Why. Now, without any further ado, my conversation with Frankie D. Gonzalez. And just you're a pro- prolific playwright, you're a pro- prolific television writer. Um, within the playwright community, your stuff's always coming up. So, just first off, give us your background and wh- where you come from. How did how did someone from Queens, New York, end up in in North Texas and becoming a playwright? Just give us your history a little bit, Frankie. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I was born in Queens, New York, to a, a wonderful. Um, I don't care about nothing. You know, Latina mother. She's from Colombia. Um, and me, she had me and my brother, and um, you know, it was one of those situations uh, in in having us. She she felt very strongly that we shouldn't be raised in the in the situation that New York was in. You know, it was the nineties mm-hmm. coming into the early two thousands and everything. So it was still very much. It's a different New York now, um, of course. So a lot of people won't recognize what I'm talking about unless they were there at that time. But she took us out, moved us out to Orlando, um, and we lived there for about seven eight years, and then she. Uh, felt that it was becoming too much like New York again. The financial crisis was sitting Orlando. So at around 2006, she moved us out to Texas and she forced me, my mother, I, I love her to death. She forced me to take a theater class and because <laughs> I was like, no, I don't want to take a theater class. That's not gangster. What are you talking about? And um, after that, I, I caught the acting bug and then I realized I'm not really good at this but I really like these scripts. Let me try to write these. And so that's how I ended up becoming a playwright was just from my mother forcing me to take a theater class. <laughs> Very nice. Yeah. And yeah. From, from there you ended up in, in Texas of all places. Texas. Yeah. In Texas, she, she, the story that she tells me in, in terms of how she chose Texas when, um, when she decided to move from Florida was she blindfolded herself, pulled out a map of the U S and then stabbed at it with a pen. And she got just north of Dallas. And so that was, she was like, all right, we're going to Dallas. And we moved, we, we moved to Dallas. I don't know if that's true. That is a story she tells me. And I, and I think she's got a bit of the playwright in herself, too. So she, she likes to make these, these stories. I hope that's not what she did because that could have been way dangerous if we'd ended up in, like, the Pacific or something like that. Uh, but, <laughs> you know, um, that's, that's, what she, that's what she did. She said she did the same thing for the move to Florida. And um, I guess that's how she decides her moves. <laughs> So you, you you catch the you catch the acting bug you catch the playwright bug, what what did that what did that journey look like as you you decide I want to be a playwright, so what, what what was involved in that was it school was it just being around other playwrights was it just writing 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 what did that journey look like to becoming real realizing you wanted to become a playwright and, and, and getting into the industry, yeah um, so a lot of me wanting to be a writer I, I'd been wanting to be a writer since I was five. It was actually um, listening to hip hop albums that really got me into wanting to be a playwright. I remember really specifically my uncle's um, Walkman. He left it at my mother's apartment up in New York and I started listening to it and it was the Notorious B.I.G.'s Ready to Die. Mm. And listening to that album straight through, I was five, six, I don't know how old I was, but um, I listened to it and I just loved the words, even though it was a lot of swearing and bad words I couldn't say. I really fell in love with it. So I wanted to write. The thing is though, from the age of five to 16, I tried every single type of writing and I sucked at all of it. I wasn't a very good rapper. Um, That became apparent really quickly. Um, I wasn't a very good poet. I can't describe anything in terms of like vivid detail, like a novel requires. I wasn't great at short stories, but I always really liked writing people talking, but I never really conceived that that was a thing Um, even when they were forcing us to read Shakespeare in class until I took that theater class in Texas when I was, when I was 16 up in, uh, up in Dallas, um, well, Denton technically, but, um, but yeah, she, once I did, once I, I I took that class and I, I 
started really looking at dialogue. I remember I, I read in one week Six Characters in Search of an Author by Luigi Pirandello, Blood Wedding by Federico Garcia Lorca, and Samuel Beckett's Waiting for Godot. After reading those three, that, that just did it. I realized this is what I've been wanting to write all this time. This is what I want to do. And so I set out um, that summer, uh, my junior year in high school, and I read a, like something like 100 and something plays, 160 Ooh. or something like that, just trying to learn the craft because I didn't. I felt like I was so behind and I needed to catch up. So I read like all of Tennessee Williams as much as I could find. I read Arthur Miller, William Inge, and then I started really getting into like the absurdists like Harold Pinter and Ionesco, and I was just learning, just trying to learn, okay, this is how you write a script, and what I would do is I would start copying them so I would start trying to mimic Pinter's language, or I would start trying to mimic Beckett's bleakness or the comedy in Ionesco and see, am I good at this? No, I'm not very good at this. Okay, I'm leaning on this Pinter guy. I like these pauses that he keeps putting in there. Let me let me put this here. And, and, I, and that's how I started really developing my plays. So a lot of my really early high school, college stuff is just mimicking like a Sam Shepard style or trying to do something over the top like a Tennessee Williams. Um, until finally, by the time I got to college, I realized I'm not really, um, good at any of those, but I know what I, I know I want to do this. And, um, so I, I, I continued to write and write and, um, through college and everything and, and behind all of that, and this ties into, to even flowers, um, behind all of that, when I told my, um, the, the people that I would visit in prison, um, that I wanted to be a writer, they said, okay, yeah, go be a playwright, go do that. They would tell me to read Shakespeare. They would tell me to read Gabriel Garcia Marquez. They would ask me to read Kafka from just a young age to, to even now, just encouraging me to read and to learn and to, to, to keep trying these different things. And um, it really, I, I don't feel I discovered my playwriting voice until about four or so years ago, because all it was was just mimicking and trying to copy other writers until my son was born. Mm -hmm. And then I, I finally, when my son was born, I finally realized I now had an audience that I wanted to write to because before I just wanted to write a good play, but I wasn't ever looking for my audience. I wasn't ever looking for someone to talk to. I wasn't looking for anyone at all. And I realized that I'm not a great speaker, um, per se, not as good as a writer as, at least. And I, I realized I want to write to, to my little boy. Um, and so I started writing this play, uh, to him about the men that were, that remained in my life. My father had left my life rather early. And, um, I wrote to him about his uncle, his grandfather, his, his other uncle. I wrote to him about the, the relationship that I formed with them. And that became the, the basis for even flowers. It started out as just one scene. And then I started writing other scenes to show him, Hey, these are the men that you come from. This is the, 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 the paternal love that I received that I'm going to try to give to you also. And, and this is what they've given me. And I, I hope, this is something that you can look at and say, wow, um, these are, these are people I can be proud of instead of just looking back at, you know, what's behind my father. I, I don't know. I don't know what my, uh, paternal family looks like. I, I know some of them, but I don't know the full, the full history of them. And, um, so that, that's really what helped me find what I wanted to be as a writer was having a son, having a child. That was the, the biggest motivator of all. I, I now wanted to speak to him and he's the only audience that I care about. And if I'm, if I'm writing to him um, and I feel like I've done a good job of communicating what I want to, to him, because I know it's this kind of, I don't know if it's a Latino thing. I don't know if it's just because I didn't really have a, a dad that was communicative with me. Um, I know I'm, I'm going to have trouble talking with him, but I can, I can write a play. I can write the hell out of a play, you know? <laughs> so I, I can, I can tell him everything I want to say to him in these characters. And it's just like, this, this is my gift to you. Um, and when that happened, the moment that happened from the ages of, of 16 to 24, it was nothing but rejection, rejection, rejection. Unfortunately, your play was, uh, we wish we could all those, you know, the usual letters that you get. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly even flowers started hitting semifinalists. Mm -hmm. It started hitting finalists, and then it co-won the Repertorio Español's MetLife Nuestras Voces Award. It, it went to the Great Plains Theater Conference. It hit semifinalists for, for Bay Area playwrights, and I, I, it hit finalists for Ashland this year. And I, it was like all these things started coming, and then, um, and then The Lark called me for Playwrights Week in, in 2018. And, and that's, that's really what the journey has been from there. From that Playwrights Week, my agents came along. 
from there, I got my, my job in, in television, um, writing for 13 Reasons Why. And then um, I, I ended up with a manager. And so it's, it's just been that. I really feel that having a son and, and finally finding the person that I want to speak to when I write my plays was the thing that, that made me the playwright that I am right now. I love that because I think there's something important about, I know, being a creative person, well, just finding your muse, finding that person that you're, you, you, you want, you're, you're inspired by and that you want, you want to work for. And whether that's a person or a thing or something you're inspiring to, just having that muse, having someone or something that you're like, I'm not doing this for me. I'm doing this for my, my spouse, my, my mom, my, my son, my daughter. It's just, that's so important in the creative process. And uh, I don't think we talk about it enough, um, but that, that's, that's really amazing. So w- within that, so you, you you started becoming, you know, getting, getting um, even flowers, you know, it was being semifinalist, finalist, and been picked up, so on and so forth. What, how, how did you get into television writing? Because we are entering the, the golden age of television. Every, everybody in every production company and their mom's doing a streaming service now. And you're, you're a playwright from Texas. And all of a sudden, you know, you're writing for Netflix. How did that happen? Um, I was nice to a white woman on a bus in Omaha. <laughs> um, <laughs> I was, I, I wish it were any different. I really do. Um, I was, um, I, I'd, I'd gone to the Great Plains Theater Conference with Even Flowers. Um, and, we had gotten on this little bus. They took us from the hotel to the college where they, where they hold, held, hold the conference. And one of the playwrights that had won had also been um, a director of development with, um, with 13 Reasons Why. And I hadn't known that. I just sat down next to her and I just started chatting her up. And, you know, I, I talked about how much admiration I had for her play or anything like that. I don't know if it's, if it's safe to say her name or anything like that. But, you know, um, but I was just talking with her and she was just like, who are you? And I said, oh, I'm, I'm Frankie. My play is going up. It's a really long one called Even Flowers. And she said, OK. And, and I thought that was it. That that was that was all. Um, and the next thing I know, um, she goes to my reading um, at the Great Plains Theater Conference. And she said, I loved it. It was a beautiful play. Um, do you have representation? And I said, no, I, I don't have representation. And she put me in contact with um with with my my agents at Gersh, my well at that point they weren't, but um she put me in contact with them, and they said hi, how are you doing? And then um after the Lark reading came, um because Gersh is based out of New York, um they were there and they said okay we definitely let's do this. And then um, one thing led to another, and both both my agents and 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 this wonderful wonderful woman advocating for me got me the the meeting with with the showrunner, uh with, with Brian Yorkie, and um from there you know that. That's that's all she wrote. <laughs> they, I, I, I guess I did I did well enough. I mean, my agent uh, was like, okay, so I just want you to know, um, you're gonna you're gonna bomb a few of these. You're, it's gonna be about 40, 50 of these before something starts, you know, really progressing. And um, this was actually my second try um, at speaking with a, a a showrunner, and it worked out, you know. And I I you know, uh, thank God, the universe, whatever whatever might be guiding everything that. Um, that I impress them enough. And, and every day I, I'm just very, very happy. And I, I pray for um, all of them because they, they gave me the shot. They gave me this opportunity. Thanks to my, my agents and, and, and this, this wonderful woman I met at great plains, the, the two, the two of them just forever. They, they, they got my heart and my loyalty. Wow. Talk about serendipity. That just, that is amazing. Yeah. Good night. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I, I, I Omaha <laughs> of all places, but I mean, but that, I, I think that's, that's really one of the things that I, I try to tell other playwrights though, is that you really don't know when you're being invited somewhere, who's going to mm. be there. You don't know what's going to happen. You don't know what kind of things are going to occur. So, you know, don't, don't ever look down on an opportunity just because it's not, you know, New York, Chicago or LA or, and, you know, any one of those big theater towns doesn't mean that there isn't someone that's there, you know, waiting or, or just looking around you you just you never know so i always take it as whenever i get invited to somewhere i'm like yeah i'll be happy to go i'll see if i can do it and i, I do everything i can to, to show up and be out there especially if they've taken the time to invest in my play like that to, to look at it to i'm always available for that you guys read my play i'm, I'm there every day shoot I'm, i i gotta beg my wife and, and mom to read my dang plays um uh, <laughs> you guys actually did it so you know i'm always grateful for that and um that that's really one of those things that if, if ever something pops up I, I i could care less if it was up in the north pole i'm there I'm, I'm i'm here for the party let's let's do this very cool so 
I, I've seen this trend um, doing doing these podcasts. I I get to listen to conversations between amazing other playwrights, and there's definitely this trend where playwrights are working in the television industry. I think of the last six playwrights I've I've had a conversation with for this podcast, five of them are writing or producing for television, and so there's that trend with playwrights. Um, their their passion is stage, but they're getting they're getting day jobs, and they're able to get their insurance, their union dues, all that stuff writing for television so what what's the difference just structurally and practically between writing for stage and writing for television just the industry the process mm-hmm. that sort of thing mm-hmm. um i think well, one one of the biggest things that i've learned is that every television room is going to be different it really does depend on the flow and the relationships that are built you know i i, I imagine because i i came onto an established show that already had a massive reputation behind it for my first TV writing job, it might be different going into something that's at the pilot stage or that you're trying to just write out the first season. Um, but what I've learned, um, the big differences between playwriting and television writing is with playwriting, there is a focus on the words. There is a focus on, on the, on the literary aspect of it. There's always a, um, the singular voice of the playwright themselves. Um, and you're, you, 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 you always know, you know, when someone is, when something is Pinterest or when something is Beckettian or, or something is very Shakespearean, you, you know what that language is. There's, there's that voice that's there. Um, with television, I, I actually, I've always, when, when explaining it to other playwrights, I've always described it as imagine it being devised playwriting. So you have a group of people in there and you're all coming up with ideas. And instead of trying to come up with the dialogue aspect of it, you are trying to come up with the idea aspect of it. You're trying to come up with the arc. Mm. You're trying to figure out what happens from point A to point B throughout this set of time, however many episodes that you've been given, however many, you know, um, storylines that you have there. And um, you're just coming up with the idea. And then from there, you're collaboratively creating and mending the script because as, as a TV writer, you, you have to make peace immediately with the fact that your lines will not survive. Yes. You will be rewritten. That, that is the biggest thing. You will be rewritten. There is, there, there is no one, two ways about it. It will happen. It's not, a, it's not a question of whether or not you're a good writer, whether or not you're made for television. It's a question of you know location, actors. Can they even deliver these lines? All, all, these, all these different factors that um, you don't even know that the showrunner knows about or that the number two knows about or that the producers know about, that something's not going to get cleared, whatever it may be. Those are things that are way beyond my my comprehension and you just have to accept. Um, you will be changed. Your words will be changed. What you should focus on is your ideas surviving. So the ideas that you pitch, if those survive, that's what you, you, you learn to find satisfaction and happiness in, not so much my specific line that was cut. And so I, I can see... For in, in the big difference between playwriting and, and television writing in that um, you are trying to create a story with TV that is being consumed and that has to live within the visual mm-hmm. medium. Whereas with playwriting, you are living within the literary medium still. It's still a literary kind of thing where um, the words describe everything and you can have just minimal stagings. That's not the case with television. You have to have something else with TV um, that, that includes the cameras. You have to consider, oh, Dialogue cannot be that long because people's attention spans are not going to last. You know, you can't have five pages of back and forth analyzing of the human condition. Some action must happen because they're sitting there watching on the screen. And there is a different quality to watching actors on a screen versus watching actors on a stage. You can do those five minutes of just dialogue back and forth on the stage because you're there with them. You're live with them. There's a kind of voyeuristic quality to it on stage than it is for television where you're watching something that is more a recorded piece. It's more of like a, akin to memory and memories are fleeting. You, you look at memory as a fleeting thing that it just comes in and out and flashes and television is similar to that as I've found at least. Um, I know that it's starting to lean more towards what playwrights are used to as more playwrights are getting into television and um, television is, is becoming more cinematic more theatrical and, and, and using the monologue and things like that. But um, you always have to consider your audience. You always have to consider you, you have to keep them interested. There's cuts that are happening. There's, there's changes of scenery, all of those things. So those are the big differences that I, I've seen is that you, with plays, everything is language. Everything is, is what you're creating. Everything is what you're crafting on the page. And it's your singular voice. With television, 
It's a team effort, and it's just not about the success of the individual, but it's the success of the overall everything, the 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 product itself. And unfortunately, unlike in the theater where the play is the everything, the scripts are not the everything here. It's the entire brand, the entire show, um, as, as it were. So it, it's it's much more about the visual aspect in, the, in that yeah, sense. Absolutely. I, I don't know if that's making any sense. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, but it's much more of the overall product rather than the individual script. People will go to see a Shakespeare play just because it's Shakespeare and it's his play. You aren't going to go read a screenplay because it's just you know the screenplay itself. No, you don't really know the writers. You know the stars in the show. You know the the brand of the show or the intellectual property that might have been tied to it, which that's its own separate thing when you're talking about um, different brands that are out there. Like, you know, how are you going to follow the comic that it's based on? How are you going to follow the book that it's based on? Things like that, the the built-in audience aspect of it. So as a playwright, you, you don't feel like you're the center of the universe anymore. You don't have the final say on things. But if you're collaborative minded, you you have a team effort mindset and you look at it more as like devised work that you're creating something that looks like it's your idea, then you'll, you'll be fine as a TV writer. And, and those are those are the two big differences. And it, it makes a lot of sense, too, because I remember when I was in film school, I was taking um, screenwriting. One of the biggest criticisms I always got from my scripts was show me, don't tell me. And I think the. the be growing, being in a theater town, going to Oregon mm-hmm. Shakespeare Festival, I'm a member there in Oregon Cabaret. I'm constantly in theater. I had this horrible habit of writing these long monologues, and they're like, "No, don't, don't, don't give exposition. Show me, show me." So that that transition there just it, it has mm-hmm. to be a complete mind shift. And like, wow, like you don't think about like stage people go there. They want to see those big grand monologues. They want to see Caesar give that monologue. Whereas stage mm-hmm. or on on television mm-hmm. on screen, it's like, "Show me these things. Don't tell me. That's why we're here." Um, but with that said, which do you prefer, writing for TV yeah. or writing for stage? Tom Chekhov said something along the lines of, I, I, I know I'm going to butcher this, um, that um, the short stories were his wife uh, and the theater was his mistress um, in terms of his preferences. Um, the theater is my wife. That's wifey status. That's my number one. I'm always there for the stage. I will always do theater. I, I love the theater. That's that's my preference always. Television is beautiful in many of its different um, in many of its different qualities and things that it brings, because there are things that television brings that theater, frankly, cannot bring. You're not going to get the the impact where you can get the the emotional impact through the visual aspect. You know, you're never going to get mm-hmm. the, the yeah. budget for like the explosions, things like that. You, you're not. You're never going to get that. You you can't do it with stage like you can in TV. But um, for me, the stage will always be that thing that it. it I got into theater because it spoke to my heart and it it allowed me to communicate for the first time in my life in a way where I I was the awkward shy kid that wouldn't be able, that wasn't able to speak. I stuttered a whole lot. Um, but the stage allowed me to, to speak the words that I have inside of me. Um, television, it's a beautiful, beautiful thing, but at the same time, because I don't get to communicate what I'm feeling completely and totally with television because of just the nature of the business, the clearances that you have to get Mm -hmm. and the showrunner's vision as well. Um, I, I prefer, um, stage for that reason. Now, if I'm a showrunner there, there, it becomes a different thing, but I am not a showrunner yet. Yeah. We might, we might see something different. I might give a different answer at that point, but I've not been a showrunner, but at this point as, as a, as a staff writer, um, versus a playwright, I will always choose, um, playwriting at, at this point it's just my first love that's that's i still get butterflies thinking about it so let's let's shift gears a little bit here let's talk about one of flower um even flowers bloom in hell sometimes the I, I first read it and like was completely shook and then listening to it um was blown away by just some of the we, we had some brilliant actors come in from um from Oregon Shakespeare Festival, from um, Southern Oregon University, the amazing theater department there. And it it just took it up even more. I'm like, oh my gosh, to hear this play, you know, in my ears. And really, I I was thinking of it one way, but then to hear, it's like, wow, like I really, you hear the inflection and the nuance, like it it happens every time I read a screenplay or a script and then I I hear it, it's, it's totally different. Um, and for, so first of all, just, man, that thing was amazing. Like it, it shook me. I think everyone needs to hear this. They need to get on play for keeps. And I'm not just toting, tuning our own horn, get on play for keeps, listen to that thing. It's just, if you have a chance to go to a reading for this play, go to the reading. I hope it gets picked up. I it just, 
it shook me and it's so unique. Um, so the format of this play is different. It's, it's a mixtape. What, what, what brought that on? I mean, it's very in, in the style and in, in, in the culture of hip hop, as far as that, that format goes. So what, what brought that up? What brought that up? Um, yeah. Uh, like, like I mentioned a little earlier, the, the thing that got me into writing in the first place was the notorious BIGs, you know, cassette tape. It was, it was a cassette Walkman that I heard and that's where my writing journey began. And so to me in re in writing, even flowers bloom in hell sometimes, um, one of the important pieces to me was to make this a, a quality, like these are just individual scenes that you see and they just have the connective tissue of it's just this, these people's journey over that 20 plus years of time over that 300 month sentence. And, um, the other thing that I did was for, for every scene in there, I listened to a different song. Um, and I, I basically wrote the rhythm of each one um based of each scene based on the song that i was listening to so um so for example one of the scenes i think it's um three three triple six four oh five three that was um that was a jc's that was a jay-z song that i listened to i listened to anything by jay-z where he talks about his nephew and there you know um uh if, if you're not feeling your real dad just put my face over his body um don't you know don't listen to nobody the, you know, the, the, those lyrics right there that it was like, yeah, that that's exactly what I felt because it was, it was my uncle who became like a, a father figure to me, even though he was on the inside, it was him that was inspiring me with hope and telling me that I shouldn't pursue anything on the streets that I should, you know, go get a degree in the arts if I wanted to. And so a lot of these things that I would, that I would, um, that these scenes that I would write were based off of just these songs that I would listen to, um, about, um, about politics or uh, about um, about religion or, or, or just just um, just different just those those different things. So uh, because it was a different song, each one, each scene, um, I, I felt this is a mixtape, bro. This this isn't just a, a play. You you listen to this with different songs, and I, I can send that that playlist along. I have to I have to try to pull it up. It was on another hard hard drive before that computer crashed, but I can I can find it again and I, I can send it over. Um, and it's it's just that I, I listened to each track and, and I wrote it that way and I wrote it based off of the conversations I would have with people about society, the the, the system or or just whether or not life was worth living. That that's often a, a conversation that's gonna come up when you have people that are doing a really long bid in, inside. Um, that that's really how the mixtape idea came together though, was I, I just listened each song, each uh, scene was a different song that I listened to the entire time while I wrote that scene. Um, but I do try to time a lot of the scenes that I write based off of a song that I'll hear um, or something that might hit. And the song might not have anything to do with the scene, but it just, it gives me the the feeling. So like, you know, the, the Jay-Z song I mentioned, you know, it's, it's, it's about a, an uncle talking to his nephew in that third verse. And he's like, dear, dear nephews, I'm writing this with no pen or a pad and I'm sending it your uncle, your best friend and your dad don't look back if you fall behind and you're feeling bad. It's like, that's, that's what my uncle would tell me. And when I heard that verse, I'm like, Oh, that's three, triple six, four, oh, five, three. Okay. Let me, let me write that scene now. And I, I'd write that or, or, um, the scene, there's a scene that, that discusses heavily the theme of, of whether or not there's any hope. Um, and so for that, that was the notorious BIG suicidal thoughts. Yeah. And, and I wrote, you know, the suicidal thoughts to it. And I'm like, well, what, what could on the other line in, because in the song, P. Diddy's trying to convince him not to do anything, uh, not to not to hurt himself, and he eventually does. And I'm like, okay, well, what can I? What could he have said to have kept him there? And I'd have been like, you know what, right there, let's throw it out there. I love you, you know, I, I love you. I, I can't let you go. Um, that and and th that that to me is how I how I composed it. Um, the the track is like, what what could I have done to stop this from happening? What can a person do? You know, let let's lay it out on the table right now. So the, those those were the the those were the the templates for me, you know, either responding to the song or taking a, an idea or a theme of the song. Um, so it's it, it's it's really those um, those ideas are like. There's another song by Big L. I'm I'm a big like East Coast hip hop fan because uh, I'm from New York. I, I gotta I gotta rep my East Coast. Uh, um, big L. There's a song called Furious Anger, and there's a line. It's like you know, um, not. Uh, um, when someone's ready to pull out the heat, you're ready to talk it out. What is there to talk about? 
Um, that's the CEO and the prisoner right there. You know, what is there to talk about right now? We, we're, I'm going to fuck you up. <laughs> that's, that's it. That's all it is. Um, there's no, there's no more negotiating here. And that's, that's really it. When I, when I hear that, it's like, there it is. That's the, that's the feeling that I want right there. And I just play that song over and over again to help keep that feeling in me. Um, and yeah, it's, 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 it's what I do. And one of the plays I'm writing now, there's this song that I, that, that I just recently heard. And I'm like, I found it. Thank God I found this song and it, it's called heavy with hoping. Um, and I listen to the song and it's an EDM artist. And, but the thing is, is the lyric just hits me. I'm heavy with hoping. Um, and it's like, yeah, okay, perfect. Let me start writing to this. And I'll, I'll play that thing for 10 hours while I write just 10 hours over and over again to just keep that, that feeling. And, and that's really how I compose a scene. So that's why a mixtape felt very apt for me because each scene was a different song. And so it felt like a, a hip hop mixtape to me. Within within Flower Blooms and Hell, you have the, the different roles there. But the, something that really stood out to me was the interludes and how the interludes always had something with with, just, with art there. Like there was always this artistic emphasis within the interludes. What brought that up? That well, up? I, I got this really irrational belief that the greatest mind um, in American history is sitting inside a prison, wasting away in there without any opportunity to ever give back to society. Um, I really do believe that that some of our, our most gifted people are locked up for, for crimes that they felt that they were forced to commit because of the situation that they were in, you know, whether it was the cycle of poverty, feeling like because you don't have an education, you're never going to make it. Um, those things that, um, that really stuck with me because I'll be, I'll be really honest, as, as grateful as I am to school, as, uh, as wonderful as book learning is, there have been no greater teachers to me than the men that I would visit on the inside because they would, they would ask me questions that were deeper than anything that you will read with Sartre or Heidegger or anything like that. You know, they talk about theories, they talk about academic things, these philosophers, but these guys are actually living it. They actually have things to say about the notion of, of time. They have things to say about the, the state of the world. They actually understand something like waiting for Godot because they are waiting for something that is never guaranteed to come. And even if freedom comes, when what's the guarantee that they're going to get anything out of that freedom? What's, mm-hmm. what's the promise of anything at all? Um, so to me, those interludes, it was so important for me to have those because one, they're, they're slightly comedic in comparison to the prisoners, much more dramatic scenes where it just, you see the, the stripping away of a man. And I, um, I read, essays by Malcolm X. I remember one specifically where he said that, you know, being able to read the dictionary, um, even though he was trapped in prison, he was never more free than when he was able to start reading and he would just read voraciously. And that's really what that all became to me. Um, for those scenes was these, these men are, are such intelligent, intelligent people, even though they didn't go to school or they don't have the book smarts, they have everything they have all the makings of, of intellectual giants, um, and they have their own conclusions on things. They have their own conclusions on what the metamorphosis might mean, what what um, waiting for Godot might mean, and they're valid and they're they're beautiful and and um, they they come with to me more satisfactory answers about the questions of of notions like life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness because they're actually deprived of mm-hmm. liberty and the ability to pursue happiness and. Um, so they, their, their, their theories and their thought processes are, are, are just that much more beautiful. And the other thing is, is I, I, I'll confess that, um, a lot of those scenes with the, um, with the inmates, with the two, the, the two little inmates, um, are the scenes of me when I was a 10 year old getting asked questions by, by the men that I would visit. So it'd be like, all right, so tell me, tell me, Frankie, what, what, what's, what's this mean? Why did he turn into a cockroach? I don't know why he turned into a cockroach. Uh, I think I think that it's because like it's supposed to represent something. All right. So what's it represent? What does it mean? I don't understand it. I think it represents like how a person sees himself, right? And 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 they and I, I thought that I was teaching them, but mm-hmm. they were the ones teaching me, you know. And they was like, but what what's a metaphor? Tell me what a metaphor is. Oh, well, a metaphor is like yeah. it means one thing, you know, and it, it'd be those things. And only now with the with the benefit of hindsight do I realize 
oh, they, they were basically teaching me in that old school Socratic method with that circular stuff, making me have to analyze things. And they understood all along. They always knew. And, um, and to me, th- those two are, are just the, my tribute to, to my teachers, my, 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 my three teachers, my, my heroes who, who made me think critically about things, who made me think critically about, of all things, literature, um, and, 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 and encouraged me in a way that I never, I, 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 only, just, I only just now in the last few years realized was the, the foundation by which I, I created my playwriting identity. Um, it was thanks to that. As as we were casting for this play, I know that it was very important to you that for this recording we cast people of color for each part. Why mm-hmm. why why was that important yeah. to you? Yeah, for me, the only lens by which I, I have to understand the system is from from the lens as 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 a Latino male, as a, as someone that as a person of color. I I know that in prisons, um, it is a very wide wide. Um, it's very diverse. <laughs> we'll, we'll say that the, the populations are very diverse in there. But to me, the, the one thing that I understood from my perspective as a person of color was that this era, this the 80s to the 90s and even into the early 2000s, was the era that basically wiped out entire, mm-hmm. entire um, generations of men just disappearing into the system, getting deported, um, getting murdered, getting lost to addiction because of the, the policies that, that led to the modern drug war, all, all of those things. Um, and so to me, growing up, that's what I was surrounded by were people of color, you know, black, Latinx, what, um, what have you there, just um, without a father. And then by the time the dads are getting out, that's around the time the age that their kids are, yeah. are becoming of age to go into prison. So then it's just like this generational blank that happens and the dads have come out and the, the grandfathers have come out and they're now in a place where it's like, wait a minute, what the heck? I, I only rich people had cell phones. Now everyone has cell phones. How do I use these? How do, how do I use this technology? What is the internet? You know, and having to catch up and then it just leads to a cycle of recidivism the, so that when they're going back in them, their children are getting out and it's just this back and forth uh, of life. Um, and, and to me, the, those were the circumstances I was raised around. Um, so to me, having those people of color there, um, it just reflects what I saw, what, what I witnessed. Um, and the other thing is, is that you, you're treated differently on the inside. If, if, mm-hmm. if you're, you know, if you're black or brown, you, you just are, you're, you're, you're going to be treated differently. You're, you're going to, you know, I think, what was it just recently, just, I think it was in the last two days, they've discovered in West Virginia, a whole bunch of department of corrections officers doing a, a C Kyle, um, on a photo. And so that tells you everything about the kind of um, dynamic and how different it will be to have, um, you know, just the just just what kind of experience you're expected to have going into any kind of Department of Corrections, whether it's federal or at the state level. Um, that that's that's just the the thing that I know. Um, and and so for me, it was like I, I needed it to reflect my experiences because I, I wouldn't recognize it any other way. And um, the men that, 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 that suffered in, in, in those prisons that I grew up around, they, they, you know, brown as can be, you know? And, um, so it's like, uh, that, that's, that's what I wanted to see there. And, um, really the, the other thing, um, is, is that I think that it was a really, to me, very interesting to analyze and explore what it means to be a a correctional officer. And you are a person of color Mm -hmm. holding other people of color inside, um, that, 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 that was another thing that I really was very fascinated by. And so I actually talked with correctional officers of color who, who, who really, who really gave me a lot of insight into the whole notion of, you know, we're all doing time in here. I did all I could to stay out of prison. And in the end I ended up in a fucking prison. <laughs> and I, I, I just have a few more privileges extra, but I, I, if I'm called, I'm called, I'm here, I'm bound to this damn prison. Right. And it's like, wow, that is fascinating. And I think to me, a correctional officer of color for that character, at least that's, that's interesting. A lawyer of color, you know, there's also the scene is like, just because we share the same skin tone does not mean that I have your same experience. Those, those kinds of things are, are things that I, I wanted to explore, especially um, because you're, you're never going to ex- escape ethnicity. You're never going to escape race. Um, and you're never going to escape people that might have a different, um, a different, uh, mindset than you. So in the case of like the, the correctional officer, he's just like, you know, he, he believes that they're savages. He believes that he's different until he realizes, you know what, 
no, I'm not. And I, I kind of deserve all the things that are about to happen to me. So go on, beat me up. Or the lawyer that's just like, wait a minute, just because I've done this with my life does not mean I owe you anything. And there are questions there that, that, that have to be asked. And those are questions that I would love to see um, directors, um, actors, all of them really talk about those things and, and start opening it up because we, we don't often get to see that. What, what, what happens when we have people that might not be necessarily on your side, you know, all what, what, what's the, what's the <laughs> phrase, all skin folk and kin folk, you know? Um, and it's like, it's true. Um, and I, I, I wanted to explore that and that can only be explored through the lens of a person of, you know, people of color cast, you know, that, so that's, that's really what, what influenced that there is, is my own, how I saw it and what conversations I really wanted to spark having a lawyer and a CEO of color, um, you know, keeping people inside that world of color as well. So how did, w- with the passage of time, mm-hmm. what, what in your experience inspired just that passage of time? Cause you know, you, you said as you know, inmates come out, you know, they, all these things, everybody has a cell phone now. And then you have all the pop culture references like the Super Bowl with Janet Jackson. Yeah. What was kind of the impetus for that? Yeah. Um, to me, I, I think that the, the unspoken um, 11th character in that play is, is time. Um, I, I don't think that you can ever talk about any kind of prison narrative without the notion of time, because that is literally the penance that you're, you're, you're being made to pay by society. You are paying in time. You must pay in your time. It's the most precious resource of all. We don't get it back. We can't, you know, go out to space and find more of it. And unless, you know, we start messing around with black holes, but, um, uh, we're, 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 we're not going to be able to get it back. And, um, without acknowledging it, 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 the, the play itself would not be, um, half of what it is because that, that is the punishment. You are getting to see everyone else moving forward and progressing with their life and you do not progress at all. You maintain the same routine. You keep doing the same things. You watch all of these things occurring. You you see from behind bars nine eleven occurring, and you're you and life keeps going. You 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 are you are trapped, and you are uh, in a world where you don't get to go see your nephew take his first steps. You don't get to see graduation. You don't get to see any of those things. And um, there is also, and and to me, this is why I also wanted to center it around people of color. If you're if you're impoverished and you lived in the city and you've lived in the projects. Go into those, go into those rooms, mm. and they look just like a cell. They they get you ready for it before you even know your own name. They get you ready for your number before you know your own name. And it is a pipeline. It it it, it is something that's there in the same way that there are pipelines to success for the for the rich and the wealthy that go to these private schools that end up in these wonderful little things like the Federalist Society. If you're if you're trying to become a judge, um, and it's it's a great pipeline to get to the highest offices to get to the highest places. The same thing exists for poor people. It's just you're getting a pipeline to prison. You're getting a pipeline to cheap labor. You're getting a pipeline to to providing these things. And and the thing that's going to end up always coming up is you're giving up your time. You lose everything. Um, you 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 lose your humanity. They they take all these things from you, and it's just the last thing that they'll take is 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 your time, and they'll wring you dry until finally they let you out, and then you go right back in um, to give them more of your time because. What else are you going to do? This is your pipeline anyway. You may as well just give us your time. We'll give you your meals. Um, and, and, and then that's it. Um, so to me, that, that passage of time was important um, to have in there and to, to have those pop culture references that, oh, yeah, I saw the Mike Tyson. Well, it was on the TV. Or, yeah, you see that Janet Jackson? Oh, yeah, yeah. Nah, the – and then some of the things that, that people will laugh at now, but then mm-hmm. you realize, oh, wow, he's so far behind us. Um, like things, I think it's like the, you know, the Cubs will never win the world series and look, they've, they've won it, but you know, he's trapped in there. He's, he's trapped in a world where the Cubs never won the world series. He's, you know, the, those, those kinds of things that, that, that occur that it's just like, it's, to me, it's tragic. Um, and coming out, I, it, it's one of those like, oh my gosh, I didn't know that they put roller skates inside sneakers. Now, you know, those, those kids that roll around in those, um, that wasn't a thing. And that was one of those things that shocked my grandfather, I was like, what, what is that? And I'm like, well, what, what do you mean? And then, um, the idea of, because, you know, going inside before the, the golden age of, of the internet's greatest, uh, export, um, he was like, wait a minute, you tell me I could pull up videos online and there's just like as much as I want. And like, yeah, 
oh my god, what? How do they do that? <laughs> it's like, and 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 those are those are the funny aspects of it. But then you also see that oh, my old restaurant's mm-hmm. gone. Oh, he died. Oh, that there's no one that lives in the apartment anymore. Oh, there's no, there's oh oh, and it becomes a where am I? And it's kind of like Rumpelstiltskin, oh. not Rumpelstiltskin, uh, Rip Van Winkle. That's it. Rip Van Winkle, where you wake up and it's like, what has happened? Um, I, I, I love good King George. And it's like, oh my gosh, this traitor to America, get him, get him, you know? And, it, and it's like, no, I, I just fell asleep. I didn't know that we won independence. What, what do you mean independence? It's very similar um, to me. It's, it's like you, you were forced to do a Rip Van Winkle time jump and you come out one way but the world's another way. Um, and, and that's why it was important to, to include time in there for me. So with this play, what is your hope that, what do you hope that if, if an inmate in Pelican Bay State Prison or someplace else happens to hear your play, uh, if you play for keeps or whatever happens, what, what, what do you want to inspire in them through this play? Uh, that, for me, um, what I what I really want to tell them, and 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 I'm telling the men that that were in there as well, um, is that uh, you're loved. Um, for one, you haven't been forgotten, and there are people that that hear you, and they and they they see your pain, they see that you're not the dumb animal that they try to say that you are. They're not, they're not the horrible individual that you are. That that, that m- mistakes are not what define you. That you still have the right to things like finding love, that you still have the right to, to things like education, that you, you still have the right to to be a hero, that you you do not surrender those things just because of the circumstances that that that, that surround you, that you you can find those things like redemption, even though they're cheesy and stupid, those aren't lost to you. Your humanity is not lost to you and you are still human, you are still beautiful and mistakes were made, absolutely mistakes were made, but um because for me, um, I'm not. I'm not going to try to excuse the things that that that, that, that my family might have been accused of. I'm not going to try to make any excuses for any of those things. But um, I know that when you have a choice to make, and you really need to make sure that rent is paid, and you really need to make sure that kids are fed, you know, what what would you do? What, what would you do at that point for your for your child for for your for your loved ones for for all these things and and yes life is filled with the regrets of the things that we wish we could have done different i wish i never did this i wish i never did that but that doesn't mean that you're any less than just because you got a number um attached to your name just because you're wearing a jumpsuit a mistake was made but you are still human and that's what i really want want them to see is that you're still human and and you 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 still have value you you are not what they say you are. You you are not the. You can you can move on. You can you can go forward. You can find something, and um, even if you don't feel like you deserve it, you, you can still get those opportunities. You can still be heroic. You can still triumph, even though these things have happened. And then that's really what I I wanted with the the end point for the two inmates and the prisoner. Even even though the prisoner. Um, Spoiler, uh, he dies. <laughs> um, even though he, he, he dies at the very end, he, he finally finds like, I can do this. I got my chance at long last. I can prove I'm, I'm a good person. Um, and with the inmates, you know, it's the triumph of love, the triumph of, of, of like, you know, we're, we're here together. We stay together, you know, that the bond of, um, of two people that they just simply love each other and they're just going to wait until it's safe. Um, they're going to protect each other. They're going to feed, eat, sneak a carrot out to each other so they can eat it. They're going to read books together, um, and those things are not in inesca- those, those things are not closed off to you just because you're locked up in between um, four walls, a glass pane that separates you from your family, whatever it may be. You you are still human, and you still deserve all of these things. You you do. That's what I want to sell, uh, tell them over and over again. You do. I know life was shitty to you. I know that these things happened, and I know that. Even you don't believe in yourself, but I believe in you. I believe in you because I know these things are in you. I know that that these things are in you because if they weren't in you, then the the, the three men that I would visit, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna cry here, but um, the three men that I would visit, they wouldn't have never given me hope. They they would have just told me, you know, fuck, you're gonna, you're just gonna end up in here. So what what are you even trying to be a playwright for? They were the only ones who who told me, 
other than my mother, of course, that I could be a playwright. They were excited by the idea of me being a writer. They were like, my, my grandfather said it, it was better to get an arts degree than a warrant for my arrest. It wasn't like other people that are like, oh man, you should find another thing. It's like, no, you you be a playwright. You go do that. You, I'm proud of you. When are you going to be on Broadway, man? What are you, you going to do? Those, that's what I want to tell them. And I want to tell other people that too. It's like, you inspire hope in the people that visit you. You inspire hope in the children. You inspire hope. You you are still a father. You're still an uncle. You you are you are not just a number. You are a human being, and you deserve to have a story. You deserve to have an arc where you get redemption, where you get happiness. It's not the end. Prison's not the end. It's it's not. That is awesome, Frankie. This play, I'll tell you why it it has shook me, and my my hope that this thing gets produced, you know, on a grand scale. It gets. It gets seen by everyone on stage, maybe even on screen, because I think they could have a great impact on just people's mindset of the the, the prison industrial complex. Like it's, it's a business for for so many people. It's, it's cheap labor. It's just have, having seen a small glimpse in a community that surrounds one of these prisons. It's like wow, it really this is this is not okay. And what what you've done here is just like this. this I think this will this has a potential to impact culture and and the R system here in the United States and North America uh, greatly. And I, I just want to thank you because it, it opens up my eyes too. It's just someone, you know, as white suburban kid, like, wow, like this is a reality I've never seen. They get a glimpse of that. Like, my gosh, like we need to do something um, about this. And it, not only is it just artfully done and inspirational, I hope it calls people to action to, to do something about what's happening in our prisons and in these communities. So just wanted to, wanted to thank you for that. And uh, before we close out, um, wh- where can people find you? What else are you working on? And um, what, <laughs> yeah, yeah um, well, I'm, I'm I'm on new new play exchanges where you can find most of my plays um, on, under Frankie Gonzalez. Um, the next play that I'm working on currently is a um, a play actually about. It's it's a it's a personal play, um, autobiographical called Paletas de Coco. Um, it is uh, a solo show that it has an experimental element. I am I have not seen my father since two thousand five. I don't know where he is specifically. The people that I've asked and followed up with have all told me different stories. Every single one of them. So I don't know where he is. And so I created the show in an attempt to find him. It is about three Christmas eves in my life. Um, December 24th, 2005 was the last time I saw my father. Um, December 24th, 2009 was the last time I attempted suicide. And December 24th, 2015 is my son's birthday. And, um, I'm using, I'm basically, uh, I've written this letter to the person that I fear the most. I'm looking for my father and I have someone come up on stage with me and I ask them to read this letter for me because I cannot read this letter. There's a, a story in the book of Exodus Um, where God has tasked Moses to speak um, to Pharaoh, but he can't do it. He asks if his brother Aaron can do it. Um, And of course, God eventually says yes, um, despite much anger. Um, And so I I am essentially looking for my Aaron. But before they can read this letter out loud to my Pharaoh, I want to tell them the story of these three Christmas Eves. And, um, And so they can understand what the letter actually means. And um, so, yeah, that, that is the, the play that I'm currently writing. I'm trying to get people to, um, to see it, give me readings or, or take meetings over it. Um, on the TV side, I am trying to write a pilot about my time in LA over the last six months during, uh, during my 13 Reasons Why contract. Not about the actual writing uh, room. I, I, I wouldn't do that, but actually about the Airbnb that I stayed in, where um, the Airbnb that I stayed in there may or may not have everything is plausible deniability, I guess, in the world, but there may or may not have been adult videos being shot in the next room over. Um, and over 73 days, just staying in, in that madness with the other guests and this this guy that, that owned the house. Um, it was a, a journey, a surrealist journey that um, I hope people like once I finished up the the, the pilot and the, the overall like episode summaries. Awesome. Frankie, thank you yeah. so much. And uh, we're looking forward to hopefully working with you in the future and getting getting more ears and, and eyes to hear and, uh, and see your plays, man. So thank you so much. Thank you. I really appreciate you taking this time with me. Thanks for listening. If you'd like to hear more from Frankie, his play, Even Flowers Bloom in Hell Sometimes, will be featured here on the Play for Keeps podcast in two weeks. 
Play for Keeps podcast is a production of the Ashland New Place Festival located here in beautiful Ashland, Oregon. This episode was produced by me, Andy Neal, with art direction by Cara Quinn Lewis and written content edited by Carol Florian. Visit us online at ashlandnewplace.org. We're also on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. Help us spread the word. Like, follow, share, and subscribe. I'm your host, Andy Neal. Thanks for listening to the Ashland New Place Festival Play for Keeps podcast. <laughs>